7. How did the doctrine of the Trinity come about? Well, it is a very, very long answer, I suppose, uh, but briefly. Basically, what happened was the doctrine of the Trinity has existed, or, or of the triune gods have existed, mm. for many millennia before I okay. came to Earth. So okay. there are many uh, religious concepts that were constructed, both Eastern philosophies and uh, sort of Middle Eastern philosophies, that all revolved around this concept or idea that there was a triune godhead of some kind. Now, sometimes it was taken as a mother with two children. Oh. Sometimes it was taken as, you know, a god with two additional gods. Sometimes it was taken as uh, a group of gods that all needed to work together mm. to accomplish creation mm. and so forth. And in different philosophies, and people can research this if they wish, and I don't want to go into a long-winded discussion of it here, um, there, are, there are all sorts of philosophies that were around prior to my coming mm. on earth. So, so we must understand that people's idea of God has never been very conclusive through, throughout <laughs> history. You see, once they walk away from this God working with your heart thing that I'm yeah. describing, yeah. then you also walk away from the possibility of understanding God from God. Mm -hmm. And so what you start doing then is you start constructing ideas about yes. God from your own ideas. Yes. And of course, all of those are going to be flawed because God's not telling you what God is. Mm -hmm. And once we enter this relationship with God, once we enter this process of becoming at one with God, we have the ability for God to tell us what God is. Now, unfortunately, most Christians are very adverse to the concept of God telling you what God is, and instead they have a strong desire to tell God what God should be, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Now, um, they also had deep misunderstandings of my relationship to God. And this occurred shortly after my death, this began to occur. You see, they knew that I had some kind of special relationship, but they didn't understand what I was meaning when I was saying that I was at one with God. Mm. Because on the other hand, I also said that I was a son of God. Mm. And none of my disciples ever assumed that I was God. Mm. They all knew that I was just a man, and I stated categorically that I was just a man, just the same as them. So none of the disciples or apostles ever believed that I was God. They, I often talked about being the word of God mm -hmm. for the reason that yes. we have previously discussed on yes. another question, and that is because God had written his word on my heart. Mm. And as such, I could become the word of God through my example, through the, what I would say, what I would do, how I'd interact with people. I became what God would do in exactly the same condition and situation. Mm. So, so I called myself the Word of God. Now, they didn't later, you know, people thought, well, what does that mean, the Word of God? How did he become the Word of God? Is there some special thing where he's now a part of God or something like that? And then when I talked about becoming at one with God, of course, mm. there was additional confusion because they thought at one with God meant, did that mean that I was saying I was God? Or did that mean I was saying that I had this unique relationship with God that nobody else had? Or what did that mean? You know, they didn't really understand what it meant because they hadn't had it personally and they hadn't heard the teachings personally. And so they then made, made presumptions, a lot of assumptions about what I was teaching. So as time occurred from my death onwards, there, all of these assumptions began to be made about the words that I had stated, all of which could have meant something completely different. Mm. But because the persons involved in making the assumptions had not got or developed a relationship with God, they didn't know what I meant. Yeah. And so what they started to do was they started to change things that they read. So if they did get a scroll, for example, if they ever were lucky enough to get a scroll <laughs> or they were a copyist, they'd make little annotations that we now call glosses or gloss that end up in a glossary. Yes, yes. They'd make little annotations. Oh, this is what he meant. In other words, they were now imposing their ideas yes. and concepts of what I meant upon the text. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, because they did that, they were making these annotations, there were these growing feelings, these feelings growing. What, what was Jesus saying about God and his relationship with God? And because they themselves didn't have the same relationship with God that I had, that I was actually teaching, that they could have if they decided to develop it in the way that I described, 
they didn't have this relationship, so they, they themselves could not understand my relationship with God. Because if they had developed it in the same manner that I had, they would then understand the relationship. And then they started to assume that that meant that I was God, mm. somehow God incarnate on earth. Mm. Some, and I did say that I've come to earth in order to bring God to light, which I hadn't done. But again, that was all misinterpreted into other, under, what, what does that mean? Does that mean he came as God? You know, does that mean he was a part of God? And, and so now all of these concepts, which were all present prior to Christianity anyway, about the God being, you know, mysterious and, mm. and nobody could understand mm. God, all started to get imposed upon my teachings. And so over a period of the next three or four hundred years, and by the time of 325, the, the Nicene Creed, mm -hmm. the Council of Nicaea, by that time there was already now a very firm concept that, because most of the men involved in this did not have God in their hearts, and they were using their intellect yes. to try to resolve this yes. question. And as a result of that, they misinterpret almost everything I said. And they then constructed concepts of God, which were very similar to some pagan concepts of God. Interestingly, they did the same with many other concepts that I taught. So, for example, you know, the whole idea of Christmas and Easter all was mm. a very similar uh, reasons mm. why they come up with those things, which were an amalgamation of pagan teachings mm. Mm. with Christianity, which were uh, many times done for political expedience, not mm. just for any, uh, some kind of intellectual reasoning or arguments. And they were often just done because, oh, there's a pagan over there who believes that we should celebrate December 25th for the, for the sun god, you know, Ra. And, and then there's a Christian over there who believes that Jesus was born and that was a good time to, to celebrate. Now, we don't know when Jesus was born, so let's make it December the 25th mm. so mm. Everyone, everyone can be happy. Mm. <laughs> and mm. they did this with so many teachings. In mm. fact, all, a lot of my teachings about heaven, they did the same thing, uh, you know, Instead of understanding that everything was a gradient depending yes. on condition of love, they started polarising heaven into being heaven and hell. Mm. You know, they did the same with teachings about the devil. I often referred to devils, yes. which were people who had passed yes. from earth who were in a very, very dark condition, who had very, very murderous and other mm. uh, terrible emotions in them who were affecting people on earth. Um, and I often referred to devils, but that was interpreted as the devil. Mm. And then unfortunately, as a result of the devil, there's now this concept in Christianity that the devil exists. Yeah. And there, there's this person that God created. And you get this that, terrible dualistic, you know, there has to be a God because there's a devil. I mean, what a ridiculous... What a, yeah, <laughs> and, and there has to be a devil because there's a God. It's yeah. just as ridiculous. In yeah. fact, even more so, because if you think if God mm -hmm. created all things, why would he ever create the potential for a devil to exist? But uh, there's not much logic in many of these arguments. Yeah. And many of these arguments came far from pre-Christian times. Yes. So, you know, there was this concept of the duality, duality. of the universe mm. that existed way before Christian mm. times. And many of these concepts were pagan concepts that were included into Christian concepts. And then what they tried to do was try to make my words or make the words of other people who wrote in the Bible fit yeah. the concept, yeah. uh, which yeah. is an issue of integrity of interpretation really mm. and and as a result of that we had this growing problem so the question you had asked was about the trinity with the trinity there were many competing concerns so by the time of the nicene creed of the nicene creed mm -hmm. in 325 constantine who was the man who, mm. who was a pagan mm. uh, at the time decided see see what had happened if we look at the history of it only only 14 years prior, in 311, Christians were, were given a reprieve from being persecuted. And in fact, uh, the emperor at the time, I think his name was Galil Galil Galilaeus or Gallius or something, he, he, he was staunchly opposed to Christianity, so much so that he persecuted them right up until near his death. But he realised at his death or on his deathbed, he realised that the, the whole political concept of torturing and, and persecuting Christians was not working. Mm. So, so he, actually, um, uh, he actually gave Christians immunity from persecution just before his death. And then two years later, Constantine r ratified that as a law. And so it became law that Christians could, was, uh, Christ, uh, Christianity was now a not, no longer an outlawed mm -hmm. 
uh, religion. That's right. But now a religion that could be openly practiced. Now, of course, many of the Christians at the time were highly, were in high amounts of rage about how they'd been prior, uh, previously treated. Mm. Many of them felt this gave them license to become violent towards the pagans as a result. And, of course, you then had quite a lot of unrest from that point of time mm-hmm. onwards. Mm-hmm. Now, also in amongst all of this scenario were these competing viewpoints of power. See, the religious power was also the political power. It was becoming very much so. Very, very similar in a lot of ways to how the Muslim world is today. Mm-hmm. Like religious power is often political power. Yeah. And, and so what would be happening is that you would have these people in positions who were also become Christian. And uh, they'd become Christian, most of, most of them, many of them, out of expedience because many of their constituents had become Christian and many of them they're now were in danger through elections of losing their position without themselves converting to Christianity. So they converted to Christianity. And then, of course, there were huge arguments about what version of Christianity they should follow. And, and these arguments were causing huge amounts of defragmentation mm. in the Roman Empire. Mm. And, and so much so that Constantine, who was a pagan himself, became very, very worried about it. So what he did was he, he, he invited 1,800 bishops, all who had power from all over the empire, to discuss the principles of Christianity, what, what are the underlying basic teachings. He, wanted, he didn't care what the teaching was yeah. as long as it was the same. <laughs> <laughs> as long as everyone agreed. So what he did is he invited everybody along. Now, as it turned out, only 300 or so of these bishops finished up turning up, and, uh, but it was all the prominent ones, a lot of the prominent ones in positions of power. There were probably 1,800 people or so who turned up because every bishop was allowed to have two ministers and, and five supporting persons with them, so you know, there was quite a lot of people who came. But there, there are historically many disagreements about how many were there, but the number was around 320 or so. Now, they got together and they had a number of different disagreements. They had, they had by this stage, misunderstood almost all of my words about what it meant to become at one with God mm-hmm. and misunderstood all of my words about my own relationship with God. As a result of that, they interpreted all of these words, which were all verbal words that were later written, that they then interpret them in all different ways. And in the end, they decided to interpret them one way. And, uh, and they, there were lots of arguments. In fact, there was a bit of violence, actually, that went on during these arguments <laughs> as well. And the people who disagreed were excommunicated and exiled. Mm-hmm. From, from the empire. So too bad if you had a different opinion. And in the end, what was formulated in 325 was the doctrine of the Trinity, which was further embellished in 385 in, a, in, a, in another creed that occurred in, in Constantinople. And these two particular creeds defined mm. the Trinity doctrine. So that's sort of the history of the definition of the Trinity doctrine. Um, not necessarily the emotional things yes. that caused the, the creation of the doctrine. The emotional things were created through this process of not understanding what I was saying because the person had not had a relationship with God. Mm. So they were now trying to intellectually grasp mm. what I'm saying without having this relationship, not therefore conceiving what, what I was talking mm. about. As a result of this, they... they changed all of the things I was stating and made it into something new, which was something completely different to what I was stating at the time. And, uh, and it actually has caused a lot of damage uh, mm. in Christian religion and a lot of damage to the souls of Christians mm. uh, who have passed as a result because their concept of God has been so distorted by the Trinity doctrine that they cannot have a relationship with God because of the doctrine. That's the sad thing. Mm. You see, the only way mm. to have a relationship with God is to receive God's concept of God into your heart. Yeah. And if the Trinity doctrine is not God's concept of God, then you're con- not connecting to God anymore. Mm. Mm. And that's exactly what's happened mm. with Christian faiths that mm. have accepted the Trinity. I know a lot of my friends, my Christian friends, many of them just 
totally bypass the Trinity the, doctrine. The, the yes. Trinity doctrine. They just yeah. uh, is being silly. And goes, if you if you yeah. speak to the average lay person, mm. the average lay person, a Christian lay person, does not really believe in the Trinity. Mm. They don't believe that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all one being. But the average minister or priest certainly does. Mm. And they hold dearly on to this concept that was created 300 years after, pretty close to 300 years after my death. And, uh, and unfortunately, they hold on to it so strongly that they threaten with excommunication any person that doesn't agree. And this is where we get a lot of control occurring in, mm. the, in the priesthood. And unfortunately, in doing this, it greatly distorts a person's relationship with God and their relationship with me because I am not God mm. and I never have been and I never will be. And every time I, it's projected at me that I am, mm. it's almost a blasphemy towards God because mm. uh, I am not God. And it also puts me in this untenable position really that, that, I, that I really uh, feel quite distressed about at times and have done and have felt quite distressed about at times in the sense that, you know, that I'm being placed in a position of God that God should have, mm. and I'm just a brother, mm. and, yeah. and, and I'm just yeah. another person, yeah. and I don't deserve this position, even though I was the first person to become at one with God, I still don't deserve the position of being put in place of God, and this is what's very disturbing about the teaching. Mm. Mm. Yes. Excellent. Mm. And I think I should point out probably in this question that there are many other teachings in the Bible that have had a similar history, mm. that have been an amalgamation of, you know, pagan type of concepts, yeah. misunderstandings of what has been said, turned into a doctrine that then has been enforced by a creed that the church created for the, for, for the, for the position of the abuse of power, basically, in the end. It's so that power is then put upon everybody who have the same belief. Now, of course, the church has a great benefit to everyone having the same belief in that everyone doesn't question what the church then does. Mm. And the church then also has this ability to guide history as it has done for nearly 2,000 years as a result of enforcing a belief. And, uh, and this, of course, is for the sake of power, not for the sake of relationship with God. Mm. Or, mm. or discovering the truth. Mm. And these underlying motivations have been present in many high religious leaders. They don't, many of them have not cared at all for any Christian concept of love. And in fact, that's why things like the Spanish Inquisition and mm. other types of atrocities have occurred mm. throughout history mm. at the hands of Christians mm. because they have not cared for mm. the underlying principles of love. Mm. Mm.